Gracious Gang, it's me, your host, Mike Cravey, host of the Gracious Guest Podcast. And I am sitting here at, uh, what time is it, 5.48 a.m. This time around, it's a little early recording. Earlier than usual, I will say. So if I sound a little mellow or a little quiet, there's two reasons for that. First reason is that you are the first people I've spoken to today, and uh, my voice isn't really warmed up. And the second reason is uh, everyone is still asleep, so I'm trying to record this early and get a head start, so uh, (laughs) I'm saving some time. So welcome to the show. If uh, you've never tuned into the show before, what you found is a kind of a hodgepodge of various sort of considerations, topics, um, musings, what have you, that uh, all uh, hover around or sort of centered on a a, uh, deeper meditation on or consideration of the transcendent, uh, truth, goodness, and beauty. And, um, you know, sometimes it is a uh, an experience that I had or a trip or some sort of, uh, you know, something I read um, in a news article or something recently that got me thinking about a particular topic uh, from that angle or it's something that I've encountered in my own professional work. It, uh, something my my daughter did, or, or some other kind of experience, and it just kind of depends. Uh, in today's case, uh, it is a book review, and it's going to be relatively short here today, but uh, one that I wanted to share with you, because I definitely think you should avail yourself of this uh, of this book. So um, before I forget, though, if you enjoy these podcasts, you want to see them uh, keep going, and uh, even if it's it's you know one particular kind, like you like the book reviews, but you don't really like some of the other stuff, that's fine. Um, this show is designed to kind of cover a lot of different uh, things and be open then, you know, to a lot of different uh, different kind of topics. So if you enjoy it, please go ahead and subscribe. If you've not subscribed already, you can go on iTunes, you can go on uh, Google, uh, Pocket Casts, Podcast Addict, uh, I think pretty much any place you can get podcasts, you can find The Gracious Guest Show and uh, share it. If you, you, know, you want to share it with a friend, share it with your, you know, your cousin Jill, you know, whoever. You know, whatever. Um, sometimes when I like an episode of a podcast, you know, these days you can just, if you're on your phone, you know, obviously you can just share that particular episode and then it gets that person there and they can subscribe um, in whatever way they like. So also go and check out the website, thegraciousguest.org. I've got um, blog posts over there sometimes where I, I go into some of these topics and other ones in a little bit more depth just because you can do that in writing a little bit, um, you know, more definitively sometimes than through uh, through radio or through podcast, that kind of thing. And I also have uh, presentations and uh, just other cool goodies over at my uh, website you can go check out. Um, also, my YouTube page is, is on there. So anyways, getting back to uh, the review here, and this is going to be pretty short. I'm just going to give you a couple bullet points. But the book, as you've seen from the title of this episode, whenever you listen, or when you clicked on it, wherever you were, is uh, Lloyd C. Douglas's The Robe. Um, and it was... A very famous book of uh, of the 20th century, the mid 20th century. Uh, they made a movie uh, within just a few years of its uh, release, and I, I want to say it was early 50s that the that the movie was released with uh, Richard Burton and some other other folks. But uh, what's cool is I've wanted to read this for a long time. All I've known about it is that it's a novel uh, that somehow kind of centers around the events of the crucifixion, or, or especially. Um, you know, the, the immediate aftermath of the crucifixion. And it's a very interesting idea to me. And uh, as an aspiring writer myself, I, I really enjoy um, that kind of historical fiction, and especially if it's, it's well-researched. And this particular copy I have, <clears throat> excuse me, I was actually reading two copies of it because <laughs> I find sometimes if it's a, a book I really enjoy, sometimes it's nice to have a, a hard copy. And if they have a really cheap version on uh, Kindle, sometimes I'll do that, and that was the case for this. I think it was like we got it at a used bookstore, um, a really nice uh, print copy of it for ten bucks. It's it's hardcover. It's like new. It's a um, Reader's Digest edition, and it's this really beautiful, um, like kind of uh, brown leather, like hardcover with um, uh, like gold lettering and stuff. And it's just a really beautiful, um, just uh, beautiful copy of it that. Like I said, it was, was hardly touched, and it included—I didn't even know this until we bought it—it it included a little Reader's Digest insert 
that was, um, it's, it's like a little brochure kind of thing that actually tells the story of it. And actually what's cool is uh, Lloyd Douglas was a, um, he was a, a Protestant pastor, and um, it tells a little bit about his life in here. I'm looking at it now. But he, uh, he was born in 1877. So by the time that he started writing The Robe, he was already um, in his uh, late 60s and, um, you know, had, had had a pretty, you know, pretty illustrious, I guess to some degree, uh, you could say career as a, uh, as a preacher and uh, tried his hand at writing. And it all started with a, a lady from Canton, Ohio, by the name of um, Hazel McCann, who wrote to him, just a sort of fan mail, uh, and wrote to, uh, wrote to Douglas and said, hey, you know, whatever happened to Jesus' robe? You know, they, they cast lots for his robe at his crucifixion. The soldiers, they cast lots, and someone got it, and they specifically say that it was not torn, which is another pet peeve of mine, because for some reason, almost every Bible movie I've seen in the last couple of years, even in The Passion, which is a wonderful movie, they, like, rip Jesus' robe apart in the movie, and I always wonder, like, the Bible specifically points out that that didn't happen. Like, why would you do that? Anyway, so she writes and she says, whatever happened to the robe? And that's every, that all starts from there. You know, his gears start turning and he writes this story. And the story, the, the copy I have at any rate, is, um, it's 500 pages long. Like, it's a decent sized novel. So, uh, Douglas really put in the work to write this thing. <clears throat> and it only took him a couple years. I think her letter was 1940. He releases the book in 1942, and uh, it's basically an instant success, as I understand it. Uh, soldiers reading it in World War II, finding a lot of, of meaning in it, a lot of interest in it, uh, and, uh, and writing home, writing to him about it, you know. So it gained a lot of popularity right away. And uh, so I, I've grown up, you know, you hear about it from time to time. Again, Lloyd C. Douglas is the robe. You know, you should read it. And I'm like, okay, well, I will someday. So I did. I finally did. And... Uh, uh, as I've mentioned before on my, actually, my second podcast, uh, way, way long time ago, I talked about some of my reading tips. You might want to go back and listen to that. So I finally figured out how to read a lot of books um, per year, and it, a lot of it had to do with just reading what I could when I could instead of trying to set time aside to read. Because you can't really set time aside to read when, at least in my life, <laughs> it's just there's things happen, you know, and your family, and, okay, I'm going to read for two hours. It's not going to happen. So I picked away at it here and there, you know, doing laundry, you know, read a couple pages while you're waiting, you know, for um, for someone in a waiting room, you know, on the Kindle, whatever it is. And uh, I love this book, and I just I want to give you a couple real quick bullets, so pros and cons is how I have it labeled in my notes. I don't know if that's really the best way to put it, because I don't think there's any cons to reading it. Let me just say them up front, well, at least one of them, I'll say the other one later. Is It is long, you know, it's, it's a good 500 pages, uh, depending on your interest level, depending on your reading habits, you know, that might be a big deal or not. Um, but again, it's a novel. I, there's a huge difference, obviously, between reading like a 500-page biology textbook and a 500-page pretty exciting novel. Um, so it is, it is a little long, uh, just be advised, you know, it'll probably take you a little while. However, it really flows. The, the story pacing is pretty incredible. It's, it's not too fast, not too slow. I found it just right, you know, a little Goldilocks sort of situation with, with reading. So some books, they're, they're great, but they take a long time to get through. Um, and uh, this one, though, is, is pretty consistently fun with a lot of cool things happening in it, and I really enjoyed it. So uh, the basic premise is that uh, we meet up with our main character, Marcellus, and he's a very well-to-do Roman tribune. He's uh, 17 or 18. He's, he's just at the beginning of his career. His father's a very influential senator, but they're also living at the time of the end of the reign of Tiberius. Because I mean, this is, again, this is right around Jesus' crucifixion, obviously. So this is you know, around 30 AD or so. So Tiberius, the emperor, is sort of in his last years. He's retreated to the island of Capri, and he's kind of a wackadoo. And, uh, you know, it's very historically accurate, too. He had a lot of uh, a lot of issues <laughs> and um, a real temper and that kind of thing. And so there's a lot of turbulence in the empire. Um, Marcellus angers a, uh, another leader who's, who's related distantly to Tiberius. He's potentially going to be the next emperor and um, is, is a very sort of terrible, terrible guy, a real hedonist. And uh, Marcellus makes him upset, and then he basically gets given a, given a promotion. <laughs> Oftentimes, you know, he gets promoted out to the middle of nowhere to the Gaza 
uh, post, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and to make a long story short, a lot of uh, interesting things happen, uh, things happen along the way. He takes uh, the family, uh, they have a, a couple of servants and slaves in their house. One of them is Demetrius, who's another young man around Marcellus' same age, who, um, and he's very well treated and everything, and, you know, the, the book uh, actually is pretty interesting the way it t- talks about slavery and kind of the c- consideration of it, and I think it's very fair-handed in terms of Roman slavery. Because of course, like the Catholic Church teaches that you know slavery is wrong. It, it's it's evil. It's it's treating a human being a way they don't deserve to be treated. You know, bottom line. Um, but this book too was good because sometimes we don't understand the the differences. Just for for a better understanding of what we're talking about, you know, that not all slavery is exactly the same either. Like there's different kinds of it through history, and the Romans had a different kind of slavery than the sort of racial based slavery that uh, that was prevalent here, obviously in our country. Um, and that kind of thing. So it's it's interesting, you know, but Demetrius actually uh, becomes Marcellus's friend and his companion, and, and he's with him through this whole book, really, and uh, is a really great character. So there's great characters. There's uh, Diana, Marcellus's love interest. Um, you know, you get uh, to meet Marcellus's family. Some of them they, they spend a little more time on than, uh, than others throughout the book. <clears throat> his sister, uh, Lucia, uh, who's a few years younger than him, uh, and then there's other characters you meet, obviously, along the way. And what happens is, basically, when they're in Gaza, Marcellus and Demetrius end up um, having to go pull Passover duty in Jerusalem. And basically, the the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, you know, pulls in the different legions, or not legions, the different um, uh, uh, garrisons, basically, from, from different areas to kind of help him with security because, you know, the Passover is so rowdy. And... And lo and behold, Marcellus actually ends up becoming, um, you know, one of the people who crucifies Jesus. You know, it's just, he's just there, you know, and he's the one who wins the robe. And he's very drunk at the time because he's never done a crucifixion before. And, and, you know, he he then is living with the horror of having done this. And then, uh, long story short, some things, some interesting things start to happen with the robe. The robe seems to almost transmit like a a connection to Jesus, and uh, it leads ultimately to uh, Marcellus and and, uh, Demetrius basically returning like um, about a year later back to Jerusalem and back to Palestine to go around and interview people and try to get to the bottom of who is this Jesus, you know. Uh, and meanwhile, there's all this issue with you know him being pursued by the authorities and stuff, and it's it's just a really cool book and. Um, as you would expect, you know, he meets some of the main key players in that New Testament area, era. You know, he meets Peter, he meets uh, uh, St. Stephen, he meets a couple other apostles and, and other people. Um, Douglas does a really cool job of trying to imagine certain people that we read about in the Gospels who Jesus healed or who might have had a quick little appearance somewhere in the New Testament uh, or in the Gospels, but we don't know much about them. And he really does a good job, I think, of building on that. He takes a really solid foundation and builds on that and did, clearly did a lot of research and, um, and, and that sort of thing. So it's just a very, very cool book. It's very interesting. There's great characters. It's a lot of incredibly rich detail. It's very well written, um, and um, it's, a, it's a book I thoroughly enjoyed. One other kind of criticism I have, there, there are a few places just you know, as a Catholic where uh, not much, but you know, once or twice here or there where he has – I think a, a kind of a reductionist view of certain miracles um, where they're kind of explained away a little bit. And the famous one, you know, and it was very vogue at the time, was the uh, the miracle of the multiplication of the loaves and fishes. You know, the miracle was that Jesus changed the people's hearts so they would share what they had. That's that's always, that interpretation's been floated and it's... Uh, that doesn't really seem to be what's going on in that story. You know, there does actually seem to be a miracle of, of multiplication. Uh, and it is, it's often understood in Catholic circles to be a precursor, or, you know, preview of the miracle of the ongoing multiplication uh, through all history, throughout the world, uh, till the end of time of the, uh, the sacred elements at the Mass. That it's a sort of a preview of that, and uh, and that's that gets missed obviously because Douglas obviously wouldn't be approaching it that way. You know, he's not he's not Catholic, but um, but that that is the the the, the deeper interpretation of, of that one. So that was of course you know, I was like, wow, it's not really he's missing it there. Uh, and Peter, you know, he 
you can definitely see some some kind of Protestant bias uh, against against Peter, and then there's no mention of Peter being the Pope, but you can clearly see a few places I thought where Douglas is trying to strongly make the argument without directly saying it that Peter's not the Pope or that Peter's not as great as everyone thinks, that kind of thing, even though his character, I think, is you know, pretty much treated fairly. Um, but so, yeah, they, so the early church, like his his depiction of the life of the early church is a little... It leaves a little bit to to be wanting, I think, or, or yeah, I mean, it's it's got some parts, but it kind of ignores some other parts, you know, that are. It basically ignores anything that could possibly be seen as Catholic uh, when we start seeing little hints of how they lived. Um, so he depicts, you know, he depicts things about their their communal life and their sharing and their outreach to the poor and their prayer and that kind of stuff. And that's yes, absolutely, but he doesn't at all depict, you know, the uh, the celebration of. Uh, the Last Supper together, you know, uh, in that kind of um, sacramental way, which we, we know from lots of historical records, we know from Scripture itself, uh, is what they were, were doing. It's it's the celebration of the Mass has always been the center of uh, all Christian worship or around which it has always been organized. Um, and even the Acts of the Apostles talks about that. So anyway, that's my only little sort of Catholic theological cr- criticism, maybe in a way that it's not – you're kind of missing something there as far as historical accuracy. Uh, but but that being said, I loved the book. It was really great. I'm definitely going to read it again. Um, not right now, but uh, but soon, you know, in the grand scheme of things. It's, it's worth a reread to kind of pick up some of the other details I might have missed here and there. So uh, definitely check it out. Lloyd C. Douglas, The Robe. You can get it on Amazon for just a couple bucks if, you're, if you uh, use Kindle. You can um, – do like I did. Go to go to a used bookstore. Look around. Check it out. You might find it. I found a copy, like I said, just a couple of bucks, you know, 10 bucks for real nice. I mean, it's again, it looks brand new. If I had got this, if I didn't know, or well, I'll put it this way. If anyone comes to my house and sees it, they will just assume that it's something that I, I paid, you know, probably 25 or 30 bucks for, and I got it for 10 bucks. So, Anyways, you can find those deals and uh, and uh, get great books like Lloyd C. Douglas's The Robe. So I'll have a link on my uh, show notes here for you if you want to go to check out the uh, an actual um, um, actual print copy of it. I'll give you the Amazon link or the link to uh, the Kindle version of it as well on there. So, uh, well, thanks so much for tuning into the Gracious Guest Show today. I love sharing these reviews with you, sharing some. Uh, some insights. One other one I'm going to link to, by the way, I'll probably talk about in another podcast, but a somewhat a similar book that was written many decades later that I, that I really enjoyed also. I want to, I want to go back and reread it. And I'd kind of forgotten about it until I read this. And as I'm reading The Robe, I'm thinking, oh, that's, you know, this was definitely an influence of Michael D. O'Brien's book, Theophilus, which similarly looks at, in his case, the beginning of the Gospel of Luke uh, and Acts of the Apostles, where Luke addresses that work to Theophilus which means, you know, lover of God or friend of God. And it's like, well, who was Theophilus? There's different theories about that, but O'Brien takes that up and writes this really awesome historical narrative similar where, where the, a, a, in this case, a Greek man goes and, and is curious because he's, he knows Luke and uh, finally is prompted to go and, and, and interview a bunch of these people. So it's it's almost like a, not maybe like a sequel to The Robe, but like you can imagine Theophilus taking place while the robes story is taking place. Basically, someone else is doing the same thing, but ended up talking to other people. So it, it's reminiscent, but it's not like he's just copying uh, Douglas. It's it's like an homage to Douglas's approach, but with some different stories. And it's really cool. So that's a great one, too, Theophilus by Michael D. O'Brien. You should check out. I might review that in the future. So, again, go to the website, thegraciousguest.org. Shoot me an email. I love to get your feedback. I really want to make this show better and, and hit some topics that you guys might be interested in. Um, uh, books maybe I should check out. Uh, truth, goodness, and beauty uh, that I might want to consider and talk about on the program. So uh, hit me up over there at thegraciousguest at gmail.com. You can also go to my website, thegraciousguest.org, and, and uh, scroll down, and there's a little contact box down there. You can send me messages directly through there, uh, and uh, you can get all the other information you need on the website. So thanks so much for tuning in today, Gracious Gang. God bless you. I love that uh, you're all out there listening to this. I really appreciate your uh, your support. appreciate uh, all the, the great feedback. And until next time, don't forget to wonder. Take care. <laughs>